you've got a list of watches in your head that you'd love to own. They're not necessarily that one grail, but they are great watches that you dream of again and again, and you keep coming back to them. So do I. Part of being a watch enthusiast and a collector is not just about owning the watch, but the whole process of thinking about the watch, reading up on it, going down to the AD and trying it on. You leave, you come back, you look at your current collection, you consider if you should sell something. The list of all these watches is often longer than is realistic for most people. It's also typically a list that has watches that are more expensive than is realistic. But it doesn't matter because making those lists, having those dream watches is part of the fun, even if they are not in any way, shape or form affordable. These are some of the watches that I've been dreaming about for the longest time. This time in. Ask me to name an overpriced brand and JLC will be in the top three. They are bananas expensive. When this watch was released, it cost $21,000. The price now is closer to $25,000. At one point, I heard a YouTuber say that JLC raising prices raises profits, and that's just nonsense. The key underlying assumption is that no customers drop off and the volume stay more or less the same. I've argued that JLC needs to be more expensive, but not by raising prices, but by removing a lot of their entry models. People need to be pushed up the funnel and into luxury materials as quickly as possible. Where you today can buy a moon phase ultra thin in steel and gold, I argue that they should have a regular date ultra thin in steel. But if you want the cool complications, including the moon phase, they should be in precious metal only. But that's a bit of a detour. 25K is a loan of money. It's a, I need to sell a couple of watches to find the kind of money to be able to afford this watch. But this Reverso chronograph is the best watch they've released in years. It's a fully functional skeletonized chronograph on the back and an unassuming but immaculate time only watch on the front. It doesn't get much more impressive than that. Unfortunately for me and pretty much everybody else, this is one of the few JLC models that seems to go above retail in the secondary market. So that standard JLC discount is not happening anytime soon. I likely can't really justify this watch, but it's just bananas good. Odds are low that I'll ever have it, but I keep coming back to it. I've never owned a Zenith. There, I said it. I've been close on several occasions, but I've never pulled the trigger. Zenith to me has three brands of watches. They have their Hublot offerings in the Defy Extremes. They have their mainstream offerings that compete with the Daytonas of this world. And then they have their retro watches. It's the retro watches that I gravitate towards. Specifically, the Zenith A384. It's a revival model that I have had my eye on ever since it was released. It's got a rectangular angular case. It's got a panda dial. It's got small hints of red here and there. This is a gorgeous watch and it wears amazingly on the wrist. Under the hood and behind the display case back, you get a five hertz Zenith movement, which is impeccably finished. It's $9,000 retail. It's a lot cheaper on the secondary market. You Either way, you get a lot of watch for your money. The downside is a 19 millimeter lug width, which would usually be a deal breaker for me, but I'm willing to overlook it with this watch. The reason I haven't bought it it's totally superficial, but two things happened. First of all, ID guy bought the watch and it, weird in the way that I often avoid doing what other people do. You'll never see me clapping in unison with people at a concert. I'll be the guy staring at all the people having fun while thinking about Brian who shouted, you are all individuals and the crowd screaming back, yes, we are all individuals. It's a stupid reason, I know, but this is my sort of weirdness. Second, Omega Speedmaster in white. I still, in my heart of hearts, feel the A384 is a million times more interesting, but a white speedy is infinitely more versatile, so I keep going back and forth between the two. It's not that the speedy necessarily is really in contention, but my overthinking brain is kind of stuck in a loop when it comes to this watch. I think it's not entirely unrealistic that I'll get a hold of this watch, but I need to figure out what to sell then. I want to jump our watch. I think the integration of a digital visualization in a mechanical watch is pure genius, and I love the totally different aesthetic that a watch like that provides. A Lange Zeitwerk is so much of a grail type purchase. So the Fears Jump Power is an affordable and impeccably made watch. At Watches and Wonders or at an event next door, Fears were there. This Jump Hour watch wasn't on display, but I asked about it and their managing director happened to have it on their wrist, so I was allowed to try it on. And it's just so cool. My biggest problem is it was only made in 50 pieces as a limited edition. Now they've made a new one. I haven't seen it in the metal. It's a watch I keep coming back to. Cassioke Steel Rainbow from IFL. 
I hesitate to talk about IFL watches mainly because it seems like a lot of us YouTubers are sponsored by them. I'm not sponsored, but with the amount of mention they get, I would fault you for thinking otherwise. With that said, the custom designed Cassiokes are cool. My wife has a version that I bought for her that she wears a lot. I really dig the Bob Marley version, but my wife says I'm too old to have a watch that has weed on the dial. So the rainbow model is probably the one I dig the most. The problem is I have so many Casios that I hardly ever wear. It's a cool watch, but in a lot of ways, I would be wasteful in spending close to $800 on a watch that would likely get very little wrist time. Trigger warning, there's a Rolex that I would like to own. My blood doesn't boil at the mere mention of Rolex. They're a giant company, they make a bucket load of money, and their watches are still more or less impossible to get. I don't like any Rolexes enough to pay over retail, but there is one watch that I want, and it's the Milgaus Z Blue. It was discontinued last year, but of all the oyster case and oyster bracelet variations that Rolex produced, the Z Blue is the only one that I really feel has a lot of personality. Well, maybe the Explorer 2, which I also have, but, but the Z Blue, super cool, super high personality watch. Rolex watches are fabulous, but if they have a weakness, it is that their designs are essentially the Oxford shirt of the watch world. They work with anything and blend with almost anything, just like you're a random BMW or Audi or Mercedes station car. The main thing that watch says about you is that you can afford it. On the one side of the coin, they are super versatile, and on the other, they are anonymous in the way that they blend so easily. But the Z Blue with the green hued glass, the sun ray blue dial, and the slightly chunky oyster case, and that orange hand, this was until its discontinuation, that last Rolex that had some personality, at least for me. Now that it's discontinued, it's had that Rolex discontinuation price bump that puts it in a price range, which I don't think is reasonable. I've got a suspicion that it will drop in price at some point. We'll have to wait and see. I've spoken about the Glasruta Panamatic Luna before. I love this watch. It's a stunning design and one of the few watches that are balanced without being symmetrical. It's not easy to do. It's also, to me, better than the Langer one. Not in terms of craft, but in terms of looks, and that's just me. It doesn't have quite that level of Langer street cred, but I do think the dial is just that bit better executed than the Langer in terms of looks. The Ploprof is a weird beast. If you've only ever seen it in videos or behind a display case back, you are likely going to think it's completely unwearable and a bit hideous. But in the metal and on the wrist, it's a totally different proposition. Pretending it isn't a chunky boy would be disingenuous at best. It's a big watch, but the lug to lug is less than that of a Black Bay 58, and it's quite close to a Black Bay 54. The place where you notice the size is from crown to flank, which is something you have to get used to. This watch is also 15.5 millimeters thick. It's much thicker than I would normally put up with, but there are modular chronograph movements out there from Grand Seiko and Omega that are just as thick, so it's not completely bananas for me. I've never really been a Ploprof person. I've always thought the colors were a bit much, but the new Ploprof in summer blue is a completely different beast. This is no longer just a rugged esoteric tool watch. Omega put together a stunning blue edition and it also moved this watch from tool to luxury. There's more chamfering, more polish, more reflectivity going on, which I'll concede it moves it away from what this watch is intended to be, a true tool, but it just makes it more wearable. I've got a penchant for watches that look different, so a Willard or a Doxa 300T or a Skeleton or an IWC Equitimer. When I want a real diver, these are the designs that I gravitate to and the Pro Prof ticks so many boxes, but it is super expensive, $15,000. Grand Seiko SLG W003. My success with dress watches is close to zero. I've owned both a Calatrava and a Saxonia, and they both got sold very quickly because I never wore the things. There were so few situations where I felt they fit into the wardrobe. That's obviously a personal thing, because I'm sure there are people out there that dress similarly to me and would happily wear them, but they've never really gelled with me. So when I mention this watch, keep in mind that I've never actually succeeded in consistently actually wearing a dressy type watch, but I like it. I saw it at Watches and Wonders, and it's almost as plain as a dress watch can be, but it's just so good looking. The dial has everything a Grand Seiko dial is supposed to have, and if you're not that impressed with Grand Seiko dials, then just do this. Go down to your AD and ask them if you can have that little magnifying glass, one of those monocle things they use, and take a look at the dial. I guarantee you your opinion will 
change. So we've got a Grand Seiko dial, I want that. It's a manually wound five hertz Grand Seiko movement, I want that. It's titanium, which I think is ridiculously cool, especially because it's not typical in a dress watch, I want that. And it's got the usual Grand Seiko, Zeratsu, hello, and all that kind of stuff going on as well. This is a massively cool watch. Blanc Pan Complete Calendar. This is one more watch where I'm flirting with dress watches. This watch is around about $20,000, which is out of my regular, whatever you want to call it, price range. But fortunately, most Blanc Pans that are not limited edition 50 Fathoms models tank on the secondary market. So it's possible to snag this watch sometimes somewhere around $10,000, $13,000. The Villeray line is the most classic of Blancpain's lines. There are all sorts of reasons I like this watch. From a technical perspective, it's a complete calendar with an automatic movement and 72 hours of power reserve. It's so often that higher end movements just have 36 or 24 or 40 hours of power reserve. And I just like the fact that this one is specced like a modern movement. It's also a complete calendar, which in itself is pretty cool. But more importantly, this specific model has no visible indents or pushes or adjustments on the case. The pushes are all hidden under the lugs and require no tools to be used. And that's just ridiculously cool engineering that I really appreciate. Dial-wise, there's a white opaline style dial and a silver dial version, which are both cool. There's also the gold with the white dial, which I actually think is better, but just so much more expensive. D depending on which day of the week, I, you know, lean one way or the other on all three of these, but the smiley face moon and the pointer day is just gorgeous. I've actually had the Breguet 5157 on the top of my list for a very, very long time, but recently the Blanc Pan has just kind of taken over it in terms of where it takes up space in my head. Final watch, Omega Seamaster 300M black no date version. At the time of doing this video, this watch has barely been released and I haven't seen it in the metal. I have to admit, I'm leaning towards it being a lazy release because it's a more expensive version of the Seamaster date version. It's still got the hideous, well, it's not hideous, the, the mesh bracelet is is, is good looking, but it's, the clasp is super, super thick. I have it on the No Time To Die and it's just like super chunky and super big and it's not particularly flexible and it's just a bad version for that watch. And there's no innovation to this watch and it's even, and I like the fact that it's an aluminum bezel, but from a product release perspective, it's it's just a lazy release and they, they should have released a 40 millimeter version. Maybe this is a transition version. I'm probably gonna do a video about that, but, but the, Release in itself is a lazy release. Having said that, I like black dial aluminum bezel with white text divers. I've got the Pelagos FXD Navy SEAL version. I've got a 62 MAS Seiko. I like black dial white text divers. And yes, it's a lazy release, but I still like this kind of watch and that's why it's on the list. I criticize these kind of watches constantly because they're, you know, infinitely boring. But the reality is I like these kinds of watches because they are incredibly versatile. They work on straps, they work on bracelets, they work on NATOs, you name it. They just work. And despite this overlapping with multiple watches in my collection, it's the kind of watch I shouldn't but likely often go for. There are other watches I dream of. A Zeitwerk from Langenzöhne, uh, Royal Oak Slim in rose gold, uh, Grubel Forse handmade, but where, you know, the watches I mentioned are expensive and something I have to save for and sell and, you know, spend time. Those kind of watches I'm never gonna have. One or two of these watches in the list could happen over time, but then, you know, a new watch comes along and they take their place. The longer I've been in this community, the less watches I actually buy. On the one hand, I'm closer to being content with what I have, and I also can't always see what I would want to part with. I also take my time with buying. I'm far less impulsive. A watch can be on my radar for a really long time before I make a decision because I don't see a point in wasting my money. And I also know that that initial, I want it, I want it, I want it, I want it, you know, that hype feeling, it eventually goes away. And for me, I try not to buy based on what the honeymoon will be like, but rather on what the long-term marriage will be like. It saves me money, it saves me regret, but the downside is I have less new shiny things. So what's on your list? Let me know in the comments. Like, subscribe. Cheers.